ACS gas training, ventilation. My name is Alan Hart and in today's video we're going to look at the British Standards BS 5440 Part 2 which is ventilation and we're going to look at the open fluid section on ventilation. I'm at Viva Training Academy today and with Russ who is the expert trainer here and he's going to go over the ventilation requirements for us also he's going to try and show you all the different examples or as many examples as possible to do with to do with the open fluid ventilation but if you do have any questions please ask them below and we'll try we'll try as best to come back with a follow-up video and and help you the best we can and as with all these videos please like and share and it's really really important for these videos if you like share and add a comment below and be really grateful if you could do that uh, yeah let's go have a look this video is for gas safe registered and trainee gas engineers under supervision please comply with the current regulations at the time good morning thanks very much again alan um, if those who don't remember me, I'm Russ, uh, over 40 years in the gas industry and today we're going to try to simplify, as much as we can at least, ventilation for uh, gas appliances. If you are already into the training side of the industry, you'll understand that there's a, quite an in-depth section we need to cover on this and we're going to try to break it up into sections so you can understand where each different appliance group gets its information from. We'll look at different vents, we'll look at different ways of ventilating, and in particular we'll look at different um, appliance groups and the various ventilation requirements for those appliance groups. Not a straightforward section as you'll already be aware, but we'll try our best to make it as simple and we'll also refer to where the information comes from so you can look back at that yourselves and obviously read and read and read again it's something that will become second nature to you but initially you do need to understand why we ventilate and where we ventilate from as an example of an open fluid boiler nowadays you don't see that many because they're being taken out and majority of appliances going in now are of course room sealed which, will, which brings its own ventilation requirements. This is a typical example of a freestanding open fluid boiler. This is an old Baxi Boston. Um, conventional fluid, as you can see, controls would of course be on the case in which we've removed, just to show you a bit more clarity. Uh, but all the air for combustion will be drawn in below the burner, under the burner, uh, directly into the combustion chamber but it's being taken from the room it's in and that's where the ventilation requirements come from now obviously for something like this you'd also use the manufacturer's instructions as the guideline to what ventilation you needed if you're on a, in a position say on a, on a job where you needed to be a little bit tricky about it yes we'll give you a calculation to work out but if you really needed to go into the depths and you're not quite sure, remember, remember to go back to either the handbook you've got, Corgi manual perhaps, or ideally the British standards. Everything relates back to the British standards if you haven't got the manufacturer's instructions. Okay, well, we're going to use the Baxi Boston, as I mentioned before, uh, as an example, an ideal example, a great little boiler, you'll come across dozens and dozens of these on your travels. To be quite honest with you, a bit of a favourite of mine because they don't really wear out, they're a great piece of kit. Baxi, Boston, you'll always find that on the appliance, you'll find the name and the model. The two refers to, in this particular case, it's the Mark II, but the bit you're interested in is the number of, it letters on the end, OF, and that refers to open flue. In other words, it's going to take its ventilation from the room. A quick example, the other way around, with the modern boilers, they might say RF, uh, fan assisted, FA, RS, room seal, various things. But you're looking for OF, you know you're going to have to make sure the ventilation is correct. Ideally, you need the manufacturer's instructions, because that will give you absolute specifics what they expect you to do. Failing that, 
the British Standards, Ventilation 5440 Part 2, but always make sure it's the up to date one, that's 2009 in this case. Um, and if, if filling that, your, your handbook, workbook or whatever you've got, the numbers should be as close as they should be anyway, at least it'll give you a good guide. But ideally, manufacturing instructions. What you will find on this particular appliance is something they call range rating. I'll just write that down for you. I'll write it down for you. Range rating. Now a lot of people ask me what do I mean by range rating. Range rating is literally one appliance will do a, a number of settings. Rather than be specific to the actual load of the property, you would buy a boiler uh, that was suitable for a range of loads. That's the best description I can give you. This particular one is the what we're going to work on is the uh, is the Baxi Boston 40. Now that just don't worry too much about that. It's just a model designation. If I just find the right page very quickly, here we are. It's the bottom of this, only a small one because we're only in a, in a workshop, we don't, we don't need a big one. But if you notice, it says the maximum, bad to see, we'll do a close up afterwards for you. Maximum input 14.95 kilowatt, minimum input 11.69. What that means is when you work out the load required for your, for your, your property, you may not need the whole of that. You might be in the middle, you might be bottom, you might be top. It also stops you from buying an appliance that's Two, twice, three times bigger than you need to because obviously do bigger versions of this. But the rule is when you're ventilating you must always, always ventilate for the highest input on the range. The argument being even if you're at lower end now, at the lower end of that range now, what if the property was to have an extension or bigger radiators or whatever? Uh, something that would increase the input requirement of that heating system. The boiler might still be suitable, but if you put the ventilation in to suit the highest setting initially, you don't, it doesn't need, to be, doesn't need to be worked out again later. And that is, that is actually a, a rule, not a rule of thumb, that is a rule. You ventilate for the highest setting of the appliance. As I mentioned, the input and the minimum input, the maximum input, I've put down here 40 being the model designation, open flue, straight from the manufacturing instructions. It actually says on the instructions 14.95 kilowatts input maximum, and the minimum input will be 11.69 kilowatts. I'm going to show you, first of all, from their chart, literally what they say their ventilation should be. And they say for the 40, straight from their chart, ventilation, the 40. OF requires 39 centimetres squared of free air for their ventilation. The manufacturer's instructions will normally always tell you what the requirement is. But just to prove that you're capable of doing this without the manufacturer's instructions, if you need to, let me show you what the, the calculation you should already have in your books and should already have done by now. We take the total input of 14.95 kilowatts. Now remember the rule, you then take away 7 kilowatts, which will give you 7.95 kilowatts. I hope you will remember why we take the 7 kilowatt off. That's advantageous air into the room. We say every room, if it's open to, certainly to, uh, to outside, windows, doors, etc., has approximately seven, uh, 35 centimetres of free air coming into that room. And that equates to at five centimetres per kilowatt, seven kilowatts. And that's where they get their seven kilowatt to remove. Seven kilowatts, five centimetres per kilowatt. And that's the advantage of air. So you always take that off for open flue. Do remember though, if you do have more than one open flue appliance in that room that's using this calculation, you only get one advantage of air. You'd add the cal if, it, it does happen sometimes. 
perhaps you've got two of these boilers side by side, I've seen it done. Uh, they do it that way sometimes to act as a backup so you don't lose both boilers. But you would be, then you would be 29.9, whatever it works out, to do two of those, but you still only take one 7 kilowatt off. So I've done that now, 7.95. You now multiply that by, and I've just mentioned earlier, 5 centimetres, so it would be 7.95 kilowatts multiplied by 5 centimetres squared which would come to on my calculation I think it comes out at 39.75 39.75 centimetres squared I think it comes out at that's calculated that's straight out of the manufacturer's instructions it just proves the point if you when you're on these jobs and you're looking at ventilation and you've got something that tells you what it should be, just as a matter of interest, when you're waiting for things to warm up, just get your phone out and calculate it. It's an easy number, minus 7 multiplied by 5. And you should come out approximately to the answer in the book. In this particular case, you come out slightly higher. So the manufacturers are saying, look, as long as you're on that number, that's fine. Now, I'm pretty sure this is quite an old, a bit older boiler now, is this one. So I think you'll find this actually will most likely to be gross. In other words, you need to divide that number then by 1.11. But don't worry too much about that in this instance. We're just looking at the moment at working the ventilation out. We'll come to that at a later date. So, the manufacturers say 39.9, 39, sorry, centimetres. The, the calculated one comes out at 39.75, so we know we're exact or somewhere near. Now the ventilation itself, we mentioned earlier, comes in from a slightly different direction from different boilers, but majority of open fluid appliances will always draw the air in underneath and through where the injector goes in. Now in this particular case, this is still showing the boiler, hopefully anyway, uh, as a naked appliance with no casings on it, so you can see what's happening. You will get your ventilation going in through this bottom section here, and that's literally secondary air, uh, secondary air around the boiler, around the burner, and going up through the combustion system. Well, the injector itself would normally be somewhere in here, if you will, so it would be drawing the air in for combustion for primary air. Remember, we talked about primary and secondary air. Primary air is drawn in at the injector straight into the, into the burner. The secondary air is anything around the burner. So your primary air is normally drawn in, always drawn in, where the injector is. And your secondary air can be drawn in pretty much anywhere around the bottom of the appliance, the, the apron of the, as they call it, around the bottom of the boiler. As long as your ventilation is correct, that will be able to draw in enough air. That's the thing to remember. As long as you've got your, your vent correctly sized, that will be correct because the manufacturers have worked it that way. Uh, briefly now, I'd just like to show you what I've just told you. We'll try and put it a little bit more straightforward. We mentioned the model, we'll just put this a backseat, um, Boston, again. And the model is the 40 OF. One was the 40 OF, the open flue. If you remember what we mentioned, the input, the maximum input, was 14.95 kilowatt. Remember what we worked on the um, advent aegis air into the room, minus, straight from the book, minus 7 kilowatt. And then we're going to multiply that by the factor 5 centimetres squared. So 14.9 minus 7 kilowatt, we're coming at 7.95 kilowatt. And we're going to multiply that by 5 centimetres, which I think you'll find comes in at 39.75 centimetres squared. That's calculating it using the book, any book that happens to be doing open fluid appliances. The manufacturers 
instructions state directly from the book 39 centimetres square. If you can understand how that works, you can see where they've got their number from. They've got their number from 14.95 kilowatts minus 7 kilowatt um, advantage here. Multiply by the factor of 5 centimetres squared per kilowatt comes in at 39.75. The book says 39. Manufacturing instructions say 39. So you can prove their figures. You can also prove that you know what you are doing when you check this for yourself. That it's just a bit of practice sometimes, even if you've got the manufacturing instructions. Don't be frightened of checking it for yourself. Because if you do get a slightly different number, I mean slightly in the sense of enough to say, well, that doesn't really work out. Read what they've done. They may have a reason why they've worked it out slightly differently. But normally, you will come within, within tolerances of their, of their figure. This leads us on, of course, to compartment ventilation, which is a slightly, slightly different way of creating that combustion air, but also cooling air, for the appliance, which we'll look at now. Compartment ventilation, as, as we mentioned, is a slightly different concept. First of all, you're not only providing combustion air, but you're also providing cooling air. What size is a compartment? Anything that's designed to be an enclosure where the appliance is, that's a very quick rule of thumb. One thing you must remember, because we're providing combustion air and cooling air, the ordinary rules of ventilation do not apply to the actual compartment. Totally separate uh, rule applies. Let me show you. What you've got to be aware of with compartment ventilation is where you're taking the ventilation from. What I've tried to show you in this quick drawing here is, this is supposed to be my poor drawings the compartment and this is the room itself obviously that would then be outside now remember we're doing this for an open flue for an open fluid appliance which needs the combustion air to be brought to it you've got two options with compartment ventilation you take it all from the room it's in or you take it all from outside you cannot do it both one from one side one from the other in other words you can't go from there into here and back out again and you can't go that direction and back out again not allowed you must either be all inwards or all outside so the, the, when you look at your charts in your books it will say from a room or direct to outside so initially, we're going to do from the room. Now what you're going to remember, of course, is, as I said before, you're, only, you're providing cooling air as well as combustion air. With an open fluid appliance, that can cause a little bit of a problem. You need a vent at high level, but you also need a vent at low level. Notice I've drawn that slightly bigger. If you look on your charts, it'll show you two different measurements. It'll show you high level and low level. The ventilation then would be the input multiplied by 10 centimetres squared and the lower one would be input multiplied by 20 centimetres squared if it was direct to outside because theoretically the ambient temperature of the free air outside is normally slightly cooler the ventilation would be high level excuse me for putting it there and low level just the same again but this time it would be 10 centimetres squared and I apologise, the wrong way around that, excuse me, 10 
centimetres squared and five centimetres squared at a high level. Purely and simply because I said before that the outside temperature is more air movement so it doesn't need as much ventilation. When we say input though, this is something that's very, very important. It is total, total input. In other words, we don't take the advantageous air off for the room because it's not in the room anymore, it's in its own compartment. So you always use total input. Um, this makes it sound quite a big vent sometimes, but in reality when you work it out it isn't as bad as it sounds. So again, I'll just put on here so it, doesn't, so it looks the same. Total input and the same for that one. Total input. Now remember what I said, you're providing combustion air and cooling air. So bearing this in mind, the air coming into this room, the whole idea of this, uh, this compartment ventilation is to circulate the air through the compartment. So you're literally getting that happening. It's circulating it through the room, through the compartment, cooling it. But be aware, it's also at the bottom vent providing combustion air for the boiler. That's why it's twice as big at the bottom. That covers more than covers the amount of ventilation required for the uh, combustion air. Exactly the same on the outside. It's going to do exactly the same thing here. But this time, because it's that little bit cooler, you don't need as much ventilation. So, if we just for a moment, oh, bear in mind, of course, that is two separate calculations. That is two separate calculations. So in this particular case, let's look at internal. Let's look at internal. We've already said from earlier, using the same appliance, 14.95 kilowatts. We then multiply that by 10 centimetres, because that's the easy one to do. Most people can do that in their heads. That gives us an answer of 149.5 centimetres squared. Now remember that's I'll do it up here. That's at, sorry, high level. And low level would be, that's the good news on that one, easy to work out, just exactly double. So that's at 300, for round figures, just 300 centimetres squared, just slightly less. I'm sure you can work that out. Um, so you see what I mean? It's quite a big vent, or it appears to be quite a big vent. Just as a a little an aside on that one because people do get a little bit um, what's the word I'm looking for a little bit uptight over the size of compartment ventilation now I do agree as appliances get bigger and bigger the compartment ventilation does get quite overwhelming sometimes and that's where quite often people start putting aluminum doors on but if you're concerned over the size of that vent one thing I found quite easy to do is once I understood it well, get your calculator, once you've got your answer, in that particular instance, let's just clear that off and put, I'm putting 300. Um, in fact, what we could do, if you like, is do it exactly 149.5 times 2. So we've got the exact, it actually comes out at, actually comes out at 299. In fact, so it's, when I said 300, I wasn't exactly uh, exaggerating there. 299. If you're concerned that that's going to be a big vent, as long as your calculator will do it, most phones will do it, just press the square root button. Might sound crazy that, press the square root button. And that basically gives you a square to get that area. And it comes out at 17.29. So you can see, you just saw that. That comes out at 17, 17.29 centimetres per side, if you will, 17.29. Now, which is just over, in fact, if I'm correct in saying it's actually, just, just over, um, just under seven inches. It's not as big a hole 
as it sounds when you say 300 centimetres, it's just something just to bear in mind. Do bear in mind though, I've okay, that twice now, do be aware that that is the compartment ventilation. And remember what we said earlier, this is two separate calculations. Internal or external. Now obviously external, this is the good news with this compartment ventilation. Over here it would be a high, can you spell it out, high would be half that, 149, and that the lower one, lower one would be uh, again 149.5 and for sorry about that 149.5 and 274.757 centimeters squared just half in fact two totally separate calculations don't mix the two up one's direct to outside and one's direct to the internal room. Be aware of that. The charts are quite clear on that, but just in case you're stuck. Total input, 14.95. High level, internal, multiply it by 10. And the lower one, just double it, multiply it by 20. Externally, total input. Do the low level one first, multiply it by 10. 149.5 just double just half it for the top one that's the easy way to do it work it on 10 multi, double it or half it depending which way you're going but we're not finished at that are we we're not finished what we're not done we've got to still put for the internal one we still have to provide combustion air so the combustion air calculation is exactly the same as we said earlier and that would of course work out at 14.95 minus 7 multiplied by 5 centimetres 39.75 centimetres squared just as a point of reference on this well before we move on from this we will recap on some of these figures later. Just be aware what we've done here. We've worked from the manufacturer's instructions and we've also done the calculations freehand. Just very quickly on this one if I can for you. These figures on here are the numbers that we've worked out using our information. British standards, um, training manuals, coding manuals, various different publications and there are a multitude of publications all have the same information in them. These are all done using information that we know. The manufacturer's instructions do actually give us an answer and in their particular case they're saying 140 centimetres squared, 281 centimetres squared, high level, low level, and externally they are saying 140 centimetres squared and 70 centimetres squared. Now the reason I want to show you that is if you do it to the manufacturer's instructions you're correct you are 100% correct but don't be afraid of working out for yourself because 99 times out of 100 and I'll, I'll never say 100 because you always get caught out is if you do it by the standards the figures in the standards you're more likely to come out just slightly above the manufacturer's recommendations so it's always better to be topside than under. What we've tried to do, what I've tried to do now is give you two separate drawings just to put a bit of clarity into this. 
Uh, Cause the other drawing, because of everything being all at once, does get a little bit confusing. And I don't want you thinking, uh, well, do you do both perhaps? People have said that to me before. So what I thought this time, I'll just pretty quickly, the same calculations, the same drawings, but just show them separately. Internally, in other words, you only ventilate one direction, not both. Internally or externally. And very quickly, the internal one, using the same figures as last time, the maximum input or the total input from the appliance, 14.95 kilowatt from the manufacturing instructions that are off the boiler data badge. High level multiplied by 10, 14.95 times 10, 149.5 centimeters squared, free area. Low level, just double, multiplied by 20, so it's double that one up, 299 centimeters squared. But remember, because it's coming from the room, you still need to ventilate that room for combustion air. So that's where the old calculation comes in. 14.95 minus the 7 kilowatt, advantageous air, multiplied by 5 centimetres squared, gives you 39.75 centimetres squared. Remember the compartment ventilation takes care of getting enough ventilation in for combustion. The external one, over here, the external one, same calculation effectively, total input 14.9, but well, this time the high level will be 5 and the low level one will be 10 because the extra cooling air from the external outside air, you can do slightly lower vents. Again, the lower vent provides enough air to also account for the combustion air. Don't forget, of course, at this point, there's no requirement to put any combustion air into the room as uh, it's all taken care of externally. That one you've got to because it's still taking the air from the room. The other calculation, because it's all external, there's no requirement to put air into the room for combustion. Just occasionally, I'm looking now at um, normal ventilation, open fluid ventilation, just occasionally you do get what they call vents in series. Now, very rare nowadays and wasn't particularly common 20, 30 years ago to be honest with you, but it is something that will quite often come up in the publications and things. If you can assume that you've got a, a, a vent coming through for combustion air, doesn't matter what the size is, just the principle of it. If you've got to go into the next room, the vent size will be the same. Even though it's going from one room to the other, the vent size is the same. There are some rules attached to that. You can't go through bathrooms, for example, and you can't go through a bedroom either for the same reason, because you don't want to be taking air from the room that somebody might be asleep in. The rule does change slightly if you get an extra, an extra room on there. And let's just say that's what we've got there. Now we've got to go through two rooms to get to the room that we need. Now those two vents would be 50% bigger, 50% bigger than the first one. Not 50% bigger than each other, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, just 50% bigger than the first one. You won't come across it very often, but the bit I am concerned about is the internal vent positions. And there is a rule, and a very important rule, on what the maximum height is from the floor. And that height is 450 millimetres, or well, it used to be 18 inch normally, but 450 millimetres. The reason for that is it's a fire regulation. If you ever get a fire, they always say you get approximately two foot, used to say 600 mil of air under the smoke. That's the reason why that vent can't be too high, so the vent, so the smoke can't pass from room to room. Externally, it doesn't matter really where you put it, there are little bits of rules and regulations around that, but. Uh, more of guidelines, doesn't really matter if the smoke can get out of the building, but internally the vent must not be higher than 450 mil. 
As a continuation of the open flute theme, I'd like to just briefly at least cover gas fires in general. Um, although they're more covered, in, covered more in the um, appliance sections of what we'll do, uh, this is a very, very brief um, but very specific area of ventilation for the gas fires. If we consider this is in two normal rooms in a, in a conventional ter terrace property, whatever, doesn't really matter. Two gas fires, two rooms. Remember, we've got adventitious air up to seven kilowatt. Adventitious up to seven kilowatt. Most gas fires, normal, conventional, what they call radiant convectors, just the fire with the, what we used to call pots or radiants, we know as radiants, people call them pots, various names for that. Most of those are less than seven kilowatt. Therefore, they don't need any additional ventilation in the room that they're in. There's no reason whatsoever to put any additional ventilation. If that was seven kilowatt and that was seven kilowatt, the advantageous air is normally deemed to be sufficient. Obviously you've got flu checks and uh, various other, other tests to do, but as long as everything's working correctly, normally that's deemed to be correct. There is, however, one slightly different rule. And it's different in the sense that uh, if it was a um, if it was a boiler, like we mentioned earlier, the rule is slightly different when we do this. And what I'm going to actually do is literally, and lots of people do this, take out the middle wall. We've now got two gas fires in one room. Now, believe it or not, now, now you should add an extra advantageous air because it's now technically only one room with two gas fires in. And the book does actually say you should now add 35 centimetres of ventilation somewhere to add the additional ventilation, the additional advantageous air. Advantageous air, I'm just going to put air, air, okay, of 35 centimetres square. Very rare you'll see it done, but that is what the book says should be done. Just one to be aware of. But just to take that back a little step, you'll most probably be aware by now there are various categories of gas fire out there. Various categories nowadays. A basic gas fire is known as a radiant. I don't know that is, it doesn't matter. Convector. You've also got a second category. LFE. Live fuel effect. That's what it's effectively a conventional gas fire but now it might have flames or logs, but the construction of the appliance is effectively the same as the old type gas fire. So consequently, the fluid is slightly different. You can also get an ILFE, and that's what we call an inset live fuel effect. Again, the construction is the same, but it sits inside the fire open. It doesn't sit proud like a conventional gas firewood. And on, cof on top of that you've also got the, your, your what you call DFE, decorative fuel effect. Now this is the one you quite often see in people's houses uh, with no, just looks like an old conventional fire grate. You'll see the big versions in pubs and that type of thing. This is the one you've got to be worried about. The rest to a degree all work on the same principle of 7 kilowatt the, advent the advantageous air is normally sufficient to feed them. DFEs, even though the input's the same, because of the flu system they incorporate into them, you've, still, you've got to be careful on the ventilation. Now, again, we're going to go back to manufacturer's instructions. If the manufacturer's instructions state no additional ventilation is required, then the 35 centimetres of free air would be sufficient. 
However, if you don't have the manufacturer's instructions, you must assume, even if it's under seven kilowatt, you must assume it needs 100, 100 centimeters squared of free area. So if I was to change this fire just to give you a bit more effect, let's just say now this is a, a an LFE, a live fuel, sorry, a DFE, sorry, a DFE and a DFE, a decorative fuel effect gas fire. The rule would be if you don't have the manufacturer's instructions, the room, rule would be you need 100 centimetres squared of free area. Same on that one. 100 centimetres squared of free area. Going back to what I mentioned earlier, somebody, somebody comes along and it happens all the time, somebody comes along and takes that middle wall out. Does that still stand? Yes it does, but now you also, going back to what I mentioned earlier, you also need an additional 35 centimetres squared for the additional advantageous air that you've now lost because this is now only one room. So in reality you would need 100 plus 100 plus 35. So in reality you would need 235 centimetres squared of free area if you had two decorative fuel effect fires. What I'm trying to show you with this really is even though a gas fire, in all its forms, is technically still an open fluid appliance. I showed you earlier the back say, open fluid appliance. Even though they're technically the same flue design, the same ventilation requirement doesn't always fit, doesn't always follow. So always be aware of what you're fitting and always check with manufacturing instructions. This is a very brief overview, uh, you need to see it a couple of times anyway. Read the book referring to this, it will specifically mention decorative fuel effects and it will specifically mention vents in series etc. Moving on from this though, now what I'd like to show you is various types of vent so you will be a little bit more aware of how to measure them, how to check them and be uh, a bit more familiar what to expect. What I've got here are a few examples of vents, just to show you, they all come in different shapes and sizes. Uh, what you need to be aware of is the construction of the vent and obviously how you could prove the size of the vent. If you come across a manufactured one, uh, and when I say manufactured one with perhaps a trade name or something, this one's a stadium, that's just a manufacturer, these are stadiums, there's various ones. Normally, not always, they'll quite often have a number on them, a dimension on them. Now theoretically, you could argue if the, state, if the manufacturer says that's the free area, that is the free area. But what if you come across one that hasn't got the manufacturer's uh, measurement on? In that case, you've got to be able to measure it yourself, which we'll come to in a moment. That's just a normal air brick. You'll come across these not as often in properties internally, but quite often in uh, sort of outhouses, that type of thing, where sometimes it's just a single block wall, so they'll quite often fit these. That's just a conventional vent. It looks like a conventional vent, but there is something specific about this vent that you're not allowed. If you turn it around, it's got a mesh on it. Now that's designed to stop, uh, as they were, it vermin, etc etc getting through the vent you're not allowed to have a mesh on an air vent for a gas appliance and domestically you are never allowed to have an air vent with a mesh on it similarly i have just got one to show you here but similarly you might find them with a slide close on them it will literally shut them off you can't have that either you must either be they must only be completely open completely open this particular one is showing you the sort of thing you get uh, to cross a, a, a cavity. 
Uh, in fact, that's pretty much a standard 11 inch cavity. They must always be sleeved. If you're passing through a cavity for a gas appliance, air supply, it must be sleeved. Now this again is another stadium, another manufacturer stadium. They've done it this way, they've got your vent on the inside, there's your sleeve, and that's the vent on the outside. Now this is a slightly different way of doing. Sometimes it'll just be an old, a normal open vent, that type of thing. But quite often they have this cowl on them. Now the idea is the free area is correct, as you can see, but it just stops a little bit of draft. But also this particular vent, quite a common one now, and it's one that I would certainly go for given the chance, it's called a black hole. Strange name, I agree. But as you can see from, from most vents, even from this angle, you can see through them. This is a black hole, bad to see. If you look through that, you can't see through it. And effectively what it does, it goes in there and it comes back on itself and then back out again. One of the problems you can get with vents going through walls, depending on where the location of the property is, is drafts if you're in a prevailing wind. If there's a draft, I'll guarantee you the customer will do their best to stop that draft. And if it means sealing it up, they'll seal it up, trust me. The other option, of course, is if, if it's on a, a relatively busy road, the noise that travels through that um, duct, which is effectively what it is, the noise that travels through can be quite uh, annoying. So consequently, again, people will try and block it up to make it quieter. This, clever idea, very simple, clever idea, but by going backwards and forwards, sound struggles to travel around corners, and the noise reduction is quite dramatic. It is something just to, be, to consider when you're putting one of these in. And the idea is, as the appliance operates, it draws the air in, rather than just blowing in as required. Uh, slightly dearer, but with the weight in gold in waterways. But, size-wise, you've got to be able to measure it. Now, there's a couple of things you can buy. You can get these yourself. I know quite a few people who've made them themselves. That's just a little, little tape, little steel rule. And this is affectionately known as a prodder, but there's, a, there's most probably a correct name for it. And it measures from 5 to 10 millimetres. So when you get... Ideally, this, this is a good one to show you first, the uh, brick one, if you will. If you slide that in, you'll notice how far it goes in. And theoretically, if I move my fingers, it will actually go right into 10. Be careful, because they taper. If you put it in from the back, you'll find that it only goes in, even on a good one, to 9. Makes a big difference to your calculation. A big difference. So in actual fact, those holes on that will be 9mm by 9mm multiplied by the number of holes. 9mm by, in this particular case, 9mm, not as it looks from the front, 10 Just one to be aware of. Also with those, because of where they're quite often located, do make sure they are clear. Because they are a wonderful spot for uh, livestock, breeding, spiders, etc, etc. Exactly the same principle applies with this one. Well, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can use the prodder. I, I, I'm not a big fan of the prodder on these. I find you better to measure it with a, a, a ruler of some description. Now, lengthwise, not a problem. Lengthwise, not a problem. You can literally do it um, across. And quite simply, you can see it from there. I'll show you closer in a second. Uh, quite simply, that's coming to... Do it way. 40 frown figures, 49 millimetres. But it's the vertical one that catches people out. You'll quite often catch people, not catch people, see people measuring these, and they'll measure it like that. From the, the opening there to the top, and that comes in at approximately 11 millimetres. That's not the correct measurement. You should do it literally at 45 degrees, because that's the actual size of the hole in there, not the front face, because it's at an angle, it's a bigger front face. And if you do it at right angles, that's only 9 millimetres. Makes a big difference. So that would be 49, I say 49 by 9, multiplied by the number of holes. Um, and that's the 
principle of masonry, that's what, they will, that's what you, you've got to be able to do if you go on and there's no name, no number, you've got to be able to work out the free area of that vent. Uh, not difficult, just need a little bit of practice doing it, that's all. I've just shown you the vents just in, in, in hand. I'm just trying to show you this in a slightly different format. Uh, again, exactly what I've just shown you, but a slightly different format. That's supposedly my, my again, my drawings simulating from the side of a, a conventional, in fact, uh, if you just bear with me, moving away from you, coming back in, showing you that one from the side onwards, if you will. That's what I'm trying to simulate with that. And that's obviously a block that we don't want to show earlier. What I tried to show you was on these, the taper. So as you put it in from the front, it would actually go quite a long way in. But going in from the back, you'd only get to the nine, which is what you've got to be aware of. It is smaller because they do taper. So you would measure the smaller side. <clears throat> what people tend to do is forget that it is a square, that it is length by width. So you've got to uh, measure two sides, multiply those together. When I say two sides, it's obviously nine by nine in this particular case. And then multiply it by the number of holes. This one, on the other hand, as I mentioned before, obviously you would do the, uh, bear with me a second, if I were to put that like that. I'll just clean it off, just put straight it up for you. You would obviously measure across the opening Whichever way you want to do it, I don't care what you use it that way. But remember what I said when you're doing it vertically, don't do it like that, do it at right angles. Do it at right angles because it's quite often much less. And when you do your calculation, you obviously your answer is going to be quite, quite a bit less. We've gone through ventilation, open flue ventilation. We really have touched the surface. We've touched the majority of it there, but we've touched the surface. There's a lot of uh, little nuances, shall we say, of various appliances. Never be frightened of looking it up. Never be frightened of looking at manufacturing instructions, just in case there are something there that's slightly out of the ordinary. We have to talk quite generally with something like this, but never be frightened of looking at other, other manufacturers, certainly the manufacturing instructions. What I'd like to just quickly go through here, just throw a few, shall we say, obvious numbers in that come up on a regular basis. And certainly as open flutes concerned, fairly well open flutes concerned, in fact I'll actually put that at the top, so it sort of reminds you of what we've been doing. Open flute, there we go. First of all we mentioned the majority of open fluid appliances, and remember, we've got a slight discrepancy with, with such as decorative fuel effect. They all invariably are allowed a certain air amount of air coming into a room, and we call that advantageous. In other words, even with room wall to wall carpets, cavity wall insulation, double glazing, there's still, they say, a certain amount of air getting into the room. So we get the air changes into the room. And for that, we always say there's approximately 35 centimetres squared of free air. You say that with almost any room uh, of modern construction. We're not yet at a, at a level, for want of a better word, where we hermetically seal. We've not actually got to that stage. Yes, some properties are getting that way, but not your average property out there at the moment. You've still got that free air coming into the room from various sources. Now remember, um, because of that free air, we're now allowed to take a certain amount of the input off and we don't need to ventilate for because of that. If you remember what I said, it equates to uh, five centimetres squared per kilowatt. So because of that, we're now, for this one, we're allowed 7 kilowatt as an allowance. So if you've got an open fluid appliance, a generally an open fluid appliance, uh, you take the seven, first 7 kilowatt off because theoretically the 35 centimetres is covering that. Again, do be careful, 
Like I say, we get a deputy fuel effect, that's not always the case. Do check the manufacturing instructions. Um, that's what we mentioned before, the five centimetres. I do apologise for just jumping across there. There's your five centimetres squared per kilowatt. I just jumped a little bit there. That's what they work everything on. It used to be, uh, without dwelling on this, I think it used to be 4.5 centimetres. It was almost a bit of a faff. And the change is quite a few years ago made the industry much easier for people to work out because the majority of people can do tens and fives and that's what we seem to use nowadays. Compartment here. We mentioned this earlier, we're both internal, in other words, from the room or external from outside. Remember what I said? The air temperature, the air movement from outside is always considered to be better than from inside. So consequently you need half the ventilation from outside that you do from inside. But do remember, the, for both of these, it's total input. In other words, you don't take off your 7 kilowatt. You do not take off your 7 kilowatt. Okay, so what's the figures? Direct from a room, com compartment ventilation, compartment air from a room, high level, it's 10 centimetres squared, and at low level, it's 20 centimetres squared, multiplied by total input, multiplied by total input. You do not take your 7 kilowatt off. Externally, it's 5 centimetres high and only 10 centimetres at low level. Again, total input. Do not take your... I can't say that enough because if and when you get to a point where you're doing assessments, that is a question that's quite guaranteed going to come up. Trust me. Remember that. Remember where to find it. Never be frightened of looking in the publications, looking in your training manuals, look anywhere you want. All the information you're getting here is readily available, but you've got to get comfortable finding that information. It'll come up time and time and time again. It will become, to a point, as I said earlier, second nature. But get comfortable finding it. Don't be frightened of looking this up. Highlight it if you've got the book. Know where it is. I mentioned vents in series and the fact that they need to be a certain size once you get over more than two. Don't worry too much about that one, you don't get it that often, but do be aware of it and look it up. It's quite clear in all the publications. But the more important part is the height of that vent. It must be at least, sorry, no more than, I apologise, no more than 450mm above the floor. No more than 450mm. Very, very serious fire regulation to stop the smoke from going from room to room. Be aware of that one. If you ever come across that, what height is that vent? Again, the, the problem we've got with this is the less and less out there now, so you're inclined to be not always aware of them. But if you as open flu, majority of that, in fact, I would say it again, vast, vast, vast majority of open flu appliances are vented from the room they're already in. Think of an, ex an example where that changes. They built an extension on the back, you know, put a, a garden room or something like that on the back. Rather than move the boiler, they just put an additional air vent in. Just be aware of what height that internal air vent is now. Does it need to be moved? It, does it need to be paperwork? Does it need to be dealt with? There's various reasons, again, that's something we'll, we'll cover uh, on, the, on the course itself anyway. As I mentioned earlier, decorative fuel effect, no manufacturer's instructions. Majority of fuel effect, decorative fuel effect gas fires now, majority of the instructions do say there's no additional ventilation required up to approximately, most of them say, they say 7 kilowatt, but they're all around, they seem to always be around 6.9 which keeps you inside that 7 kilowatt. If the customer doesn't have 
the instructions and you can't find the instructions online, which is quite often nowadays you can find the instructions online, you've got to assume, as the engineer on site, it needs 100 centimetres squared of ventilation. This brings us briefly on to what we, a separate subject altogether, and that's unsafe situations. Some of these situations I've shown you today, if they're out, there is actually a percentage it tells you in the book what you can work to on the unsafe procedures, which allows you to at least, as long as it's operating correctly, to leave it operating. It's only if it becomes outside those parameters that you may need to deal with it more severely. DFEs I'll be very, very wary of if there's no ventilation and you've got no manufacturing instructions. Be very, very aware of the appliance. Is it operating correctly? And do check the current, current update on the unsafe situations because it does vary slightly, not from month to month, but it has, it has changed slightly over the years. Always be aware, always be aware of any new changes, current regulations, updates, because you need to be on top of this when you're looking at anything. And I will, and I know I go on about looking in the books, don't be frightened of reading the books, don't be frightened of looking things up. It, it's, it's a lifesaver to other people and certainly a, a lifesaver to yourselves when you need to be more aware. Well, plus the fact, quite often, remember, majority of the time you're out there on your own. Majority are on your own. If you can look at, you're comfortable looking in that book, you're comfortable in getting a second opinion. And it can be worth its weight in gold. Now, I don't know whether what I've said to you today has helped. I hope it has a little bit, put a little bit of clarity into it. Um, as I said, we're going to go on to, we're going to move on to the other areas like flueless and, and uh, room sealed. But this is just a general total over cover of open fluid. Don't be, don't assume, as I said, this covers everything. It covers the vast majority, but do be aware, manufacturing instructions, log, um, handbooks, manuals, call them what you will, but be aware and, and read and be careful you get the correct ones. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Russell. I hope this video has been of some use to you. Please ask some questions below. Also, if you've got any, um, any videos you would like us to cover, again, if you'd like to put some comments below and we'll try as best in this series of videos with Viva Training Academy, we're gonna try and cover as many of these type of videos as we can. So as I say, just put some comments below and let us know what, what type of stuff would suit you best and we'll try and concentrate on that type of video first. Um, yeah, for anybody who's got to end of uh, this fairly long video, um, thank you very much, thanks for watching. Please, as I say, as always, like, share, subscribe, ring that bell, um, all that good stuff. Thanks very much.